this is quite an extraordinary trip compared to five years ago when Xi Jinping went to Hong Kong to mark the 20th anniversary because in these last five years things have completely changed. And this, according to some analysts, frankly, is a bit of a victory lap for Xi Jinping. He has come to Hong Kong having stared down a massive popular uprising in 2019, having locked most of the city's opposition leaders either in jail, uh, prosecuting them or forcing them into exile. Uh, one of his great nemesis, Jimmy Lai, he's in jail, but the newspaper organisation that he used to run, the Apple Daily, uh, Next Media is the parent company, that's all been shut down. In terms of the battle of politics, this is an extraordinary victory for Xi Jinping and he's coming to Hong Kong to officially swear in the new leader, John Lee, officially to mark 25 years since the British handed it back to Chinese rule. But it's not lost on anyone that in terms of the balance of power, Xi Jinping has had an extraordinary victory, if you want to call it that, in recent years and him coming to the city in this way is really quite a triumphant moment. What vision for Hong Kong did Xi Jinping lay out in his speech? Well, the first thing is he's basically made it clear without saying explicitly that the remaining one country, two systems differences between mainland China and Hong Kong are going to be retained beyond 2047. So. Let's not get bogged down in the history, but basically when the British handed it back to China in 1997, 50-year deal that Beijing pledged to the people of Hong Kong, we will maintain separate systems. You will have a high degree of autonomy, you will have freedom of speech, you will have freedom of assembly, freedom of the press, etc. Here we are, 25 years into that 50-year deal, halfway mark. Xi Jinping making it very clear today in what he said that when it gets to 2047, the final year of the 50-year deal, that things are going to continue the way they are. He said he's firmly in support of one country, two systems. He says that the central government supports capitalism in Hong Kong. Uh, it supports Hong Kong maintaining its links to the world, being a global international hub. And the reason he now seems so comfortable with that is because in the past couple of years, using the national security law, he has so effectively uh, silenced opposition in the city. So one other thing we did hear, Yvonne, today is Xi Jinping saying that the youth of Hong Kong need to be instilled with a sense of patriotism. That perhaps is a hint of maybe changes to education curriculums in Hong Kong uh, that could be on the horizon. What do we know about the new chief executive, John Lee, and how different or similar a leader he might be compared to Carrie Lam? Well, John Lee, once upon a time, was a policeman. He was then the security secretary in Hong Kong. He really appears to have been elevated because the Chinese government believes he is their man in Hong Kong. Whereas Carrie Lam, you know, she obviously ended up being uh, Beijing's leader in Hong Kong more than a representative of the Hong Kong people to Beijing. But she had a more sort of significant public profile in Hong Kong over those decades before becoming the leader. John Lee, on the other hand, he was the only candidate that the Chinese leadership put forward for this very small committee of loyalists in Hong Kong to vote for. So they say John Lee was elected. Let's cut the crap. He was not elected. He was appointed by Xi Jinping in a very indirect manner. But the point is, the expectations are that John Lee will be Beijing's man in Hong Kong a lot more than Hong Kong's representative to Beijing. And if you are a Hong Kong sympathiser in exile or wherever, if you're someone who does not feel that the future should be one of censorship and more authoritarian rule, then perhaps you would look at John Lee and think that he maybe is not necessarily going to uh, put in place uh, any uh, change that uh, turns Hong Kong around from its current direction.
So Bill, tell us more about the effect the security law has had on Hong Kongers. What's the feeling on the street? Well, Yvonne, it's kind of hard to gauge that feeling on the street because A, uh, many of the uh, democratic le pro-democracy leaders or opposition leaders are now in jail or they've been silenced, but uh, B, it's kind of difficult now to actually get into Hong Kong to ask people on the street. We were planning to go, but because of the current COVID restrictions, you, you must spend seven days in a government-approved hotel quarantine room. Those rooms are limited, flights are limited, we couldn't get in. We've all been doing it remotely here from Taiwan. Now, when you speak to people in Hong Kong who have left, yes, they talk about the politics. Many who have kids, they don't like the idea that the way Hong Kong's heading, their kids in future may have to uh, learn about patriotic education, Xi Jinping thought, whatever. But they also say that the COVID restrictions have had a major impact in their decision to leave that Hong Kong once upon a time was a global international hub. You could go in, you could go out, it was good for business, it was a gateway to China. But because the COVID rules have shut both the Chinese mainland border and Hong Kong off from the rest of the world, that it no longer is a global hub. It's a, just an expensive place to live. It's very difficult to go in and out. And so that too appears to be a factor that is driving a bit of a mini exodus now from Hong Kong of both Hong Kongers and expats. Indeed, it certainly is the experience of many we've spoken to. Bill, thank you. Thank you, Yvonne.